have a very tight program. I would like to ask you to sit down. You get your, the press releases, you get it uh, handed over by our staff, and so you won't have a problem to get it, finally. Okay, so I would like to thank you uh, uh, for being here so early, and I would like to welcome you also on behalf of uh, Professor Drexel, my co-chairman. We have a press conference now. Uh, there will be five minutes time for presentation. I would like to uh, ask the uh, presenters to stick to their time and then afterwards we will have five minutes of discussion in order to keep the time limits. And having said that, I would like to hand over to my co-chair, Professor Drexel, to announce the first speaker. Uh, good morning everybody. Thank you very much for coming at this early session. It's the Hotline One session and I want to call immediately upon Dr. Yusuf Salim uh, from Hamilton, Canada. Uh, he needs no introduction, he's a presenter of many important studies and I think that's the next one we will hear. Dr. Yusuf. Well, good morning ladies and gentlemen. You must have had a bit of a time waking up at 6 or 5 or whatever to get here. I did too. So, now I'm going to share with you the results of a study we've been doing for the last 9 years, 8 years, in 17 countries on 400,000 people. Uh, these 400,000 people are from 110 households. Out of those, 154,000 are between the ages of 35 and 70, and, that, and in those, about 8,000 had prevalent coronary disease or stroke or vascular disease, and that is the basis of this discussion. The study, as I said, is called PURE, the Prospect of Urban Rural Epidemiological Study. And I have no particular disclosures, uh, except as uh, Oscar Wilde said, my brilliance, but uh, I'll leave that aside. <laughs> now, the design of the PURE is 628 uh, urban and rural communities in 17 countries, 390,000 people, and I've told you, in these people, there was an extensive two and a half hour detailed interview, physical exam, blood uh, collected. For the purpose of the study, we have uh, various clinical conditions and drug use, and long-term follow-up is ongoing, and at the moment, about three years is the mean follow-up. Now, the countries were classified into high-income countries, which are Canada, Sweden, and the United Arab Emirates, upper-middle-income countries, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Poland, Turkey, South Africa, and Malaysia, and low-middle-income countries, Colombia, Iran, and China, and low-income countries, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Zimbabwe, and these were classifications at the beginning of the study. Recently, Poland's been called a high-income country, and uh, Colombia has moved, uh, and uh, India has moved, and Pakistan have moved into low-middle-income countries. Now, this is the, the first and most important result. We have 5,650 people who, in the community, who had prevalent coronary disease. Now, why is this study different from anything else? Most studies you've seen are based on people discharged from a hospital or continuing to be seen by their cardiologist or family practitioners. That means these people are in contact with the medical system. We have no data on what happens to people when they are no longer in contact with the medical system. And this is the only study in the world that has looked at this issue. Now, here you see antiplatelets, mostly aspirin, only one quarter, and in strokes, again, one quarter. Beta blockers, 20%, uh, less in strokes, the evidence is less in strokes. ARBs or ACE, about 20%. Diuretics, mainly proven in strokes, about 13 and 15%. Calcium blockers, again, for blood pressure lowering in stroke, reducing events has been shown. That's beneficial. You'll see any uh, blood pressure lowering agent is 40% remember stroke. The recommendation is in everybody, irrespective of the level of blood pressure. And statins, you'll see 17% in heart disease and 9% in stroke. So it is terribly poor worldwide. Now, when you look at the rates by uh, yellow is urban, blue is or uh, uh, turquoise is rural, and high income, upper middle, low middle, and low income countries. You see a clear trend with a decrease in the low uh, income countries. So in the low income countries, 
90% of people in urban settings don't even get aspirin. And 95% in rural settings don't get aspirin. But go to the high income countries where we are, only 40% remain on antiplatelet agents. That's miserable. Beta blockers, 40%. ACE inhibitors, a little higher. And statins, a little higher, 65 and 70. Remember, these three drugs have no marketing. This marketing will stop in a short time as all of them go off patent. And my expectation is this will go down. You will see there is an urban rural gradient. More marked, the poorer the country. And you will see that. And this suggests that access to medicines is important within the same country. There's a poorer access, and it's not just medicines, it is getting to a doctor. And remember, the most expensive part of medical therapy for secondary prevention is not the drugs. It's the cost of going and seeing a doctor. So now if you look, we know in coronary artery disease, aspirin, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and statins are all proven, so everybody should be getting everything uh, uh, barring contraindications, so 90% should be. But worldwide, you will see only 3 to 4% get all four drugs, and another 7 or 8% get three drugs. So 90% of the people in the world don't get three or more drugs. Zero, you will see nothing, absolutely nothing, 60%. Now, in high-income countries, you will see the zero is low, but the multiple drugs is still low. You will see 30% plus 20, only 50% get three or more drugs. And as you go into low-income countries, you will see 80% get absolutely nothing and very few. And you'll see there's a tiny line there, get multiple drugs, because combination drugs are not available in many parts of the world. Now, when you look at the biggest determinant of the cost of using it is the per capita expenditure of the nation. You will see there's a strong relationship between CHD and or stroke and use of antiplatelets, R value of 0.81, same thing with statins, same things with the ACE and ARBs, and the same things with beta blockers. So the economic circumstance of the country is the biggest driver. What I haven't shown you here, which I'll show in the main presentation, is 65% of the variation is at the country and community level, and only 35% is at the individual level. This means that if we have to improve secondary prevention, telling doctors to prescribing and telling patients to take it is not a good strategy by itself. We need systems in place to deal with this, and since doctors have been proven to be both expensive and inadequate in doing it. The new systems we need is to use non-physicians, as has been used for the control of HIV and AIDS and malaria in sub-Saharan Africa, or the substantial drop in maternal and childhood mortality in many countries like India. So secondary prevention should primarily be done by non-physicians, nurses and even non-nurses, and this can be done. This paper is going to be uh, online in the Lancet in a very short time, sometime this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yusuf. A very important new paper. Your questions are welcome. Please go to the microphone. If there is no question. Uh, is there any question in the room? Dr. Yusuf, this is very disturbing, new data, and you said uh, already what is the consequence for, for the public. It is that not only doctors, but a, a more wide uh, a population of, of professionals should deal with the problem. I think this is a global tragedy. There is no other way to say this. These are expensive, widely available drugs, and for 80% of the world, not even to get one of them, is a global tragedy. So the fascinating thing is that you are going apart from discharge, so they have apparently have no, not yeah. a dense contact with the, uh, with the health system. This is, is a mean of five years after the event. All right, and it is adjusted to the time of the event? Yes, in the main presentation I'll show it declines with time, okay. but even one year after decline, it is after, after the event, it is very low, and it declines rapidly. 
Hi, Thank you. Uh, Melissa Walton, Shirley from theheart.org. I think I already know the answer to this question, but I'd just like to hear you articulate that. Um, number one, why was the U.S. not included in this study? Just curious. And number two, based on what you know of the American system, how do you think that we would have lined up on this uh, information here? What do you think? The I think the main reason we didn't include the U.S. is this is a low-cost study, and so most people who participated had to pr pay a large part of the cost themselves to run the study. And the U.S. is not very good at contributing and being generous about these things. You know, everybody wants to be paid even if they go to the bathroom. So, so I, I think I think it's a financial issue. We could we can't afford to do really important simple studies in the U.S. It's a very economically driven society. What? How would the U.S. stack up against this? My feeling is very similar to Canada at best. At best. The high income countries here are Canada and Sweden, and they both have systems, if you're older, of medic free drugs or low cost drugs, uh, and no cost to go and see the physician. So my guess is can the US will be very similar to Canada, and we can extrapolate. You know, Canada is often thought of invading the US, so. So I don't see any more questions, then we 